Good morning and welcome back to Creative Brain Week. I'm Dominic Campbell and your host uh, here in Dublin and also uh, online. Uh, for this session, which is looking at creating health and care, I am joined by three really extraordinary people. I'm joined by three people who also have the longest job titles in the world. And so in reverse order, I'm going to explain a little bit about who they are. And then the way we'll do this is I will talk uh, with two of the people, and then we'll do a little bit of a Q&A, I think, and then I will introduce the third presentation. So uh, in reverse order, we're going to be joined by uh, Theo Edmonds. Theo is Associate Dean for Transdisciplinary Research and Innovation at the College of Arts and Media in the University of Denver. And because it's the middle of the night in Denver, he'll uh, join us by pre-record. But live, because they're in Europe, we're joined by Daisy Fancourt. Good morning, Daisy. You can see her up there on the screen. Daisy Fancourt, amongst many other things, is the Associate Professor of Psychobiology and Epidemiology and the Welcome Research Fellow in the Psychobiology Group at the Department of Behaviour Science and Health at University College London. And then, last but first in order, and with the most pleasant title, Christopher Bailey. And Christopher is Arts and Health Lead at the WHO, at the World Health Organization. Good morning. Morning, Christopher. So Good I'm morning. going to start with an in-conversation with Christopher, and, uh, and then I'm going to introduce Daisy, and then we'll see where we get to. So Chris, you can hear us then. I can hear you fine. Can you hear me? Perfectly well. I love it when the technology oh, works. So, By the way, this panel that you've assembled has some of my favorite human beings on the planet. It's fantastic to be in this company. I've been looking forward to this for so long. In fact, the last time, I can tell an embarrassing story about myself. The last time that I talked to Daisy, I just had root canal. And I picked up the phone to her and she answered and started to ask me questions and I, my brain just fogged. And I embarrassedly just said, look, I can't remember why I phoned you up and I had to go away. So hopefully Did today will be- Did the pain diminish? Was there any analgesic effect of talking to Daisy? There was, I was calmed <laughs> slightly by it, yeah. So I, okay, I, good, you I, see? I, I came up better, it worked. Uh, let's, start with, let's start with Christopher. Christopher, the, the WHO is now, you know, we know it, we know Mike Ryan here, we know Dr. Mike Ryan, the, extraordinary human has helped steer us through the pandemic. Uh, we understand the WHO works on strategic policy for health, I suppose, around the world. Why is the WHO involving itself in the arts? Well, actually, you know, let's talk about Mike for a moment. I've known Mike for over 20 years. And in fact, I remember the first week I was at WHO in Geneva, he gave a lunchtime uh, seminar to staff on respiratory pandemics, the history of them, et cetera. And I remember him clearly saying in that moment, you mark my words, in our lifetime, it could be next year, it could be in 10 years, it could be in 20 years, there will be a global pandemic. And he described it and it was exactly what happened. And the reason why I wanna kind of highlight him up front is that it was more than just the technical information. It was his ability as a communicator and a storyteller that uh, was so compelling. And, uh, and I think that's, that's part of why WHO is interested. In some ways, since 1948 at our creation, we've always been involved in the arts in terms of an intuitive understanding that to communicate with people on a, on a gut level, on a way that is more than just presenting the data and the information, but actually involving their, um, their, their persona, the, their belief system, uh, that you, you have to create that kind of bond that happens to the arts. Uh, that, and, and this relates to Brain Week as well, because we know, for instance, that um, the problem-solving part of the brain, the cerebral cortex, our, our, the, the center of conscious thought, is not necessarily where uh, our belief systems reside. Uh, that's actually in the midbrain. And to reach that area, uh, we, we have to use these artistic mechanisms. Um, and, I, and I think that's also where WHO's interest has evolved. Uh, what makes 
our current interest different than our traditional interest is that it's more than just looking at the arts as a way of more effective health promotion and health communication. It's trying to see why, uh, why that is neurologically, biochemically, and to see what are the other um, resulting health benefits from that, that is more than just um, an understanding of an issue, but being able to profoundly comfort uh, people, being able to contextualize issues, to build community, to create uh, a healing environment that can accelerate the healing process. Uh, so many different aspects are being revealed as we begin to pay dedicated attention to this. So, um, and the tech guys might make you bigger while we have a conversation and then we can swap back to uh, Daisy in a while. Um, Chris, I, I first came across you with the, um, the at-home concerts. Mm -hmm. So in a way that builds on what you were talking about, it's offering soccer maybe, or, or healing in the, in the pandemic. You might explain what they were and how they came about. Uh, the Together at Home concert? Yeah. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Well, I think in that case, uh, you may remember at the beginning of the pandemic, there was this huge shutdown of media, of, of everything else. And in, in that particular case, uh, it was actually Dr. Tedros himself who came up with the initial idea. He knew Lady Gaga's mother, who was a big champion on mental health. And he personally approached her and said, would Lady Gaga be interested in working with WHO on some kind of an event to um, bring the world together? And the result is, is what so many people around the world experienced. I believe it actually set a Guinness Book of World Record for not only the largest online audience to a simultaneous event, but uh, also in terms of fundraising at a critical time uh, of the pandemic. Uh, I, I think that, yes, we got the critical health messaging of, of hand hygiene, safe distancing, honoring the healthcare workers, staying at home, out to the general public at a critical time all over the world. But the meta message of it was, I think, even more profound, which is, we are all truly in this together, that each of our safety, security, and health is dependent upon supporting the most vulnerable among us. And that to me is the greatest inflection point of this learning experience in the pandemic. Uh, the, the forces between the, the gut reflex reaction of, I'm just gonna take care of my own, to a deep emotional understanding that actually to take care of ourselves, we have to take care of each other. And, uh, and that concert was all about that. If you, if you listen to it, it, it was a quite profound expression of that idea. And it, it, you know, the concert's easy to understand in that, that promotional aspect, uh, getting message out. And, and you can start to understand it as a, a mechanic for connecting people. And initially, it seemed to be slightly at odds, possibly, with the mission of the WHO, but it's not, because if you go back to the initial statement of WHO, which uh, was mentioned earlier this week by a couple of people, actually, you might give people here a sense of that. So in 1948, the end of the Second World War, the WHO gets formed, and it gets formed with a healthcare statement and a healthcare mission. And the statement, That's right. you might tell us a little bit about the statement and and how you build from there, how the arts went about. Well, it, it was quite visionary at the time. And when you think about it, it, uh, it, it focused on health rather than uh, medicine, shall we say. Um, I'm paraphrasing here, but essentially it said that health is not merely the absence of disease and infirmity, but achieving the highest level of physical, mental, and social well-being. And when you think about it uh, in those contexts, then the, the value of the arts becomes much more intuitively understandable. Well, of course, uh, the arts um, can help us physically, mentally, and socially. That's, that's how it evolved over the millennia, you know? Um, and I think if you look at our definition of mental health, it becomes even clearer. 
in our definition of mental health, we say that mental health is not merely the absence of diagnosable mental health conditions, but are you able to cope with the everyday stresses of life? Are you able to maximize your own potential in terms of your abilities? Uh, are you productive? Um, are you contributing to a community? Do you feel joy? Uh, these are all things that the arts directly address. So um, I, I think it, it even goes back to the very word health itself, which comes from an Anglo-Saxon word, which is cognate with the word whole. It's, it's not about deficits. It's about being a complete human. And we tend to, there's an awful lot, and Daisy will talk about this in a while, of, of uh, a movement towards analyzing the arts, analyzing the arts and health. But you walk through this slightly differently. So, so firstly, you talk about, I've heard you talk about your own experience. You did this extraordinary piece with the Museum of Modern Art. Um, where you talked about the value for you of, of painting and of pictures. I'm wondering whether you might share a little bit of that um, and it gives us a way of... Well, I, I would be happy to, and I think it also illustrates the physical, mental, and social dimensions. Uh, I, um, as, as you can probably tell, uh, I am virtually blind. I have less than 5% vision. I suffer from terminal glaucoma and as you can imagine, when I was diagnosed and I was told that uh, if the treatment were, wasn't successful, I could lose all of my vision uh, within a year. That was what I was originally told. Um, for me, it was such a shock uh, and in a way, a little bit like a death in the sense that in our modern society, 80% of the way we engage the world is visual. You know, the visual cortex represents one fifth of the brain's capacity. So to lose that element was a, um, a, a shocking experience to me. Um, when I began to adapt, it, it happened in phases. In the beginning, um, I, I was prone to moments of profound grief, of anger, of denial, uh, that this wasn't happening to me. Maybe if even bargaining, if I could eat differently or do an exercise, uh, my vision is going to come back. And then eventually, through the adoption of the white cane and the tinted glasses, uh, I began to accept what was happening to me. Um, and the physical change, which to me manifested itself through the arts, was my brain literally rewiring. Since my, my optic nerve was not sending to my visual cortex enough information to make sense of the world, slowly, through a guided process, I began to develop through new neural pathways the ability to take oral information and and to actually process that to better understand the physical environment around me. It was an actual physical neurological change. And the moment I realized that was happening, honestly, was uh, at Easter time when I was in Washington for a meeting and I decided to go to the National Cathedral to hear Mozart's Requiem. And in the middle of this amazing performance, I suddenly realized I was not only hearing Mozart and the singers and the orchestra, but I was literally hearing that music through the physical matter around me and it was forming the, the Gothic arches of the space. I, I could feel the textures of, of the space around me. I had broken through to this world of echolocation, which was a physical change. And what that did emotionally for me was suddenly I was in this strange new world that was certainly not as detailed as the visual world, but was, had its own strange beauty. And, and in some ways was, was more, shall I say, um, present. Uh, visual information goes to the cerebral cortex, uh, you know, from, the visual cortex, 
before it gets close to the midbrain, but but smell and hearing goes directly. So you you do have uh, a a greater sense of of presence of bringing you into the present moment. Um, more than that, when you think about it, visual information is literally the reflection of the surface of things, whereas sound passes through matter. So rather than feeling exiled from the world, I began to feel a deeper connection. And, and rather than seeing the darkness that was enshrouding me as, as making me pariah, I began to see it as a tremendous opportunity for self-reflection away from the noise and static of, of everyday life. Um, so just, just as you might voluntarily close your eyes to better savor a glass of red wine, just as you might choose to close your eyes to better embody a beautiful piece of music, just as you willingly close your eyes to trace the gentle slope of a lover's forearm, so too do I accept the closing of my eyes to better share this moment with you. It's a beautiful explanation of becoming an expert by experience. Yeah. And it also makes you this fantastic bridge between healthcare as something that is done to people and the, the creation of something different, some other form of system, maybe a return to. People have articulated that differently over the last few days. Yeah. So, oh, it's an important idea, and it gets to this difference between medicalizing a solution and thinking about health and well-being. Uh, I, I like to underline that there are very few examples of the arts curing anything. Uh, it's not about curing, it's about healing, and those are two very different concepts. Uh, even if music or painting or, or whatever cannot regenerate my optic nerve, neither can science. Um, but what music and the arts and theater can do is comfort me, provide context for what's happening with me, uh, allow me to actively participate in, in my community and get satisfaction. It, it allows me to practice my abilities. Um, but most of all, it allows me to find the narrative of the way forward to, in a sense, maybe my blindness can't be cured, but I can curate my life. And as a, in your professional life, then what can you take from your individual experience to the, to the WHO? How does that help? I mean, are you, is it healing the world? Not to be trite and certainly not to be cliche. <laughs> well, uh, I, I remember uh, when we first started this program, there was a lot of emphasis on sort of internal projects. We, we had a staff art exhibition at WHO uh, it, and, and uh, you, you, you can imagine how scientists sometimes uh, have a knee-jerk reaction to anything that seems subjective or uh, artistic. Um, I, I remember uh, years ago, I um, had a class in storytelling for uh, WHO staff, and there were a number of people that showed up who were interested, and they... Um, uh, I, I think they found it interesting, but they, they didn't seem actively engaged. So I redid the session where I didn't change the pedagogy at all, but I called it narrative medicine. And the place was packed. You know, so sometimes it's uh, uh, finding the right frame to the audience that you're speaking uh, with. Uh, and, and again, stepping into their shoes. And I think this concept of empathy, of, of stepping into someone else's shoes is, is key to the artistic experience. It's key to what happens neurologically with the mirror neurons, um, but it's also key to the technique that it's not about telling you what to think or to feel. It's actually about 
deep listening, deep attention, imagining how the other person feels in their context and sharing that experience with the wider group so that they can go through that process as well. Um, it, it's, it's a kind of emotional maturation that uh, is essential for us being complete humans, to being fully developed souls and, and essential for things like the prefrontal cortex, our centers of judgment to work properly. Uh, that it's, it's not just about calculating the best answer, it's about the emotional intelligence and the perspective and that triangulation with others. So that feels like a good point to bring Daisy in, that bridging into different languages and different perspectives and different ways of uh, communicating. So, uh, Daisy Fanko, I know the two of you have been uh, starting to work together. I might just uh, ask you to talk a little bit about that and then Daisy to, to um, take the floor for your presentation and then we'll come back together a little bit. Uh, Thank so you. Well, yes, it's been a real pleasure working with WHO over the last few years. I started off working with the team who are based in Copenhagen, uh, working from the WHO's European office. Um, and we've worked on a number of projects, including the big WHO evidence synthesis review that we published in 2019. But what's been so wonderful now is seeing the interest in that growing to cover the whole of WHO and therefore starting to work more with Chris and looking at a fully international perspective on this topic. You have a presentation for us and some things to talk us through. And then at the end of that, we might uh, have a quick talk between yourself and, and Chris, and then we'll uh, go into Theo's session, I think. Um, so over to you, over to Daisy. Thank you so much. I've got some slides to share that hopefully the technical team will be able to show to you now. Um, and whilst they're coming up, I can tell you a little bit about the background to this, um, which is that uh, as of uh, last year, WHO has designated my research team as a WHO collaborating centre on arts and health. And over the next few years, we're going to be growing a large programme uh, focused on research, policy and development. Um, I'm wondering if my slides can move. Ah, fantastic. Thank you so much. Um, so this WHO Collaborating Centre consists of staff at uh, UCL, uh, a number of my fantastic team who work on this topic with me, um, as well as staff from the WHO's offices, including Dr. Niels Feature and Andrea Sheila, amongst other colleagues. And this was launched uh, as a centre with three main objectives. So first of all, we're going to be carrying out world-class research into the effects of the arts, culture and heritage on mental and physical health. We're also working with world leading researchers in the UK and internationally to develop and improve arts and health policy globally. And we're also providing training programs, toolkits and resources to help develop the next generation of researchers in this field and to support others who are doing work in this space. So I was gonna give you a little bit of an overview about each of these three things, focusing in particular on the research. And our research is broken down into four core programs. We undertake behavioural science work, epidemiological work, clinical and implementation science work, and complexity science. So let me give you an example about some of our work. As we're in uh, a week focused on the brain, I thought I'd talk about some of the psychological effects, particularly in relation to mental illness. So over the last few years, we've designed a number of clinical trials, and we've also worked to understand how these can be implemented to make them sustainable and scalable. So for example, with the Royal College of Music, We've run studies focusing on the effects of group drumming for people with mild and moderate depression in the community. And we've found that just 10 weeks of drumming can lead to decreases of around 23% in anxiety, 38% in depression levels, and improvements of around 20% in social resilience and 16% in social well-being. And what's really fascinating here is that we're seeing that even when people stop drumming uh, after 10 weeks, even at three month follow-up, we're seeing these effects sustained. And this suggests that even relatively short-term arts programs and interventions can have longer lasting effects. And programs like this have now been scaled up with similar work that's been run in the UK, Germany and Japan taking it further. We've also undertaken work across England and Wales with Tenebus Cancer Care and the Royal Marston Hospitals looking at the role that singing can play for people affected by cancer, including patients, carers and people who've been bereaved. 
And the focus here, which really draws on what Chris was saying, is on how can we use the arts to support people whilst they're undergoing medical treatment for physical health conditions. Cancer is a condition that requires very multifaceted care if we're really going to support people holistically through their journey. And we found that the choirs were actually associated with decreases in levels of anxiety and increases in levels of well-being, again with sustainable results found several months after people had stopped their involvement. We've also been working on other mental health conditions such as postnatal depression, which is a very challenging condition to treat, particularly because mothers are often unable to take medication whilst breastfeeding and they can lack the time to be able to go to psychological therapies with new babies. And we've actually, with the Royal College of Music again, run a randomised control trial focusing on where the 10 week singing programmes in the community for mothers and babies could reduce symptoms. And we found that compared to usual care, usual medical care, and also compared to group play groups for mothers and babies, those who engaged in singing experienced recovery around a month earlier, which is a really significant amount of time, both for lived experience of mental health, but also for trying to avoid um, postnatal depression becoming embedded as longer term or major depression. Uh, and this is now a program that's being scaled through new implementation science and clinical trial work in the UK through the Shaper program that we're running in collaboration with King's College London, as well as with programmes in partnership with WHO across Denmark and Romania. So these are examples of the types of trials where we're developing new interventions for specific clinical populations. We're then testing those in initial trials and then we're looking to scale and sustain them both nationally and internationally. And these are just some of the examples. Over the last few years, we've led something called the March Network in the UK, which has involved over 2000 researchers, policy makers and community organisations and people with lived experience of mental illness. And we've identified hundreds of examples of similar interventions that are being developed. And um, you can see examples of these on our website, marchlegacy.org. Um, and these are just some of the names of fantastic projects we've come across, really showing the wealth of work that's happening in this space around new intervention design. We're also doing a lot of epidemiology work, and this is a real strength in my team with the statistical skills that we have. And this is where we use population level data to look at the long term effects of arts and cultural engagement on people's mental and physical health. And this is really exciting because it enables us to look at the question of prevention. In other words, if arts engagement were accessible to everybody in the population, could we be actually helping to reduce the incidence of mental and physical health conditions? Again, I'm going to present some data on mental health, given the focus of this week. So we've found that in these analyses, which involve 23 and a half thousand people tracked over four years, people who are more engaged in arts activities shown in blue and cultural activities like going to museums, galleries, concerts, etc., shown in orange, they had lower levels of mental distress, higher levels of mental functioning and higher levels of life satisfaction. Now, of course, what you might ask here is, it, is it actually anything to do with the arts and culture, or is it just that these people are healthier and wealthier? And this is where this complex diagram in the bottom corner comes up, in that, yes, we know there is a social gradient across arts participation, and there's a social gradient across mental health. So what we do is we map all of the demographic factors, the socioeconomic factors, educational factors, lifestyle factors, hobbies, how people spend their time, their health behaviours. We model all of these factors into our statistical models, and interestingly, these effects are showing independent of all of these factors, suggesting that there are links that aren't just due to these other things I've described. And we've shown this as well with depression. People who engage more in cultural activities have a lower incidence of depression over a 10 year follow up period, uh, equivalent to around half the odds of developing depression in older age amongst people who didn't have depression at the beginning of the analyses. And we found similar results as well for activities like baking and cooking having hobbies, being part of creative clubs, being part of community organisations. And this is highlighting the importance of having these arts and cultural activities within communities to support population health. We've also been able to imagine randomised control trials that you couldn't conduct in real life because they're simply unethical or impractical or far too expensive. So in this study, we imagined a population of people without depression over the age of 50 we imagined randomising them to either regular arts and cultural engagement or no arts and cultural engagement and following up for 10 years. And what the way we imagined this randomisation is we took people who were culturally engaged and we essentially found them a matched twin who was identical on demographic, socioeconomic and lifestyle factors, 
but they just weren't engaged in the arts. And we found that those who were culturally engaged had an 18% lower odds of developing depression compared to the unculturally engaged people. So this is really exciting as a way of triangulating with trial data to show effects that is, seem to be replicated with representative uh, large longitudinal data sets. And it starts to show the relevance of this, not just for medicine, but for public health more broadly. We're also doing a lot of work in complexity science, trying to understand why we see these effects. We've recently published a paper looking at what are the active ingredients of the arts that lead to their effects on health. So what is it that you're actually doing? So we have found that there are different ingredients, 139 that we've identified in total, including things like the design of the activity, the project itself, how often you're doing it, where you're doing it, um, what the actual stimuli you're receiving are, as well as the people that are involved. So who are you engaging with? How are you engaging with them? Who's leading it? What are the leaders bringing in their artistic practice to these activity sessions? And what are the context? What's the environment, the atmosphere, the economic way of engaging, etc.? And through this work, we're now getting to a position where we can start to compare activities. So be able to say, what's the difference between a running club and a community choir, or between a book group and a cognitive behavioural therapy course that means that they can have different effects on our mental health or physical health? What is it about the arts that is similar to other activities, but might perhaps just be more appealing to people? Or what is it about the arts that's actually unique that explains why it can have certain effects on our health that other interventions can't have? And I'm placing references to all of these things in the columns and I can share these slides so you can read this work in more detail because it's supposed to support the design and delivery of work and new arts interventions. So these active ingredients in an activity then trigger different mechanisms of action. So in other words, this is how can these arts activities actually affect our health? And we've identified over 600 psychological, biological, social and behavioural processes that can affect our health behaviours as well as our mental and physical health. And these operate at micro levels, so affecting us as individuals, as well as working at group and societal levels as well. Again, the references to this are shown. This was a recent paper in the Lancet Psychiatry we published. And these are just some of the examples of the types of mechanisms that we've shown here, including things relating to psychological capabilities, coping, emotions, the ways that the arts affect our brain, our hormones, our immune systems, our cardiometabolic systems, and the ways that the arts affect our habits and our social mechanisms as well. Finally, we're also undertaking behavioural science work, and this is understanding patterns and predictors of arts engagement. Unfortunately, we know there's a very strong social gradient in terms of who can engage in the arts and culture, depending on things including education, finances, ethnicity, age, etc. We even see that our parents' socioeconomic position affects our own participation. Geography plays a role as well. Depending on where you live, if you lived in more deprived areas, you're actually less likely to be able to engage in arts, culture or heritage activities. And this seems to be driven by things including income deprivation, employment deprivation, crime, disability, etc. And we also know that there are psychological barriers that can come into play. Sometimes people who've got low levels of happiness or experiencing mental health problems can face motivational or psychological barriers to engaging. And we've just published this new report last week, uh, identifying what these barriers are, individual and GP doctor levels, and also amongst community organisations and seeing how they can be overcome. And one of the ways I think these can be overcome is through things like social prescribing, whereby we're actually referring people directly to the arts. And we're seeing really promising data coming through from our analysis of social prescribing, showing that it does indeed seem to be reaching some of the hardest to reach groups. So this is just a whistle stop summary of some of the kinds of work we're doing. We're currently expanding our social prescribing work with a particular focus on child and adolescent mental health services. But I just want to touch extremely briefly on our work on policy and resources. In terms of policy, we've been undertaking work that's included producing evidence briefings, uh, working with governments both in the UK and internationally, as well as working with the United Nations, United Cities and Local Government and UNESCO, trying to develop a policy that will enable arts and culture to be more accessible to individuals and also more embedded within health policy. And our website for the new collaborating centre includes lots of our policy work to date and details of upcoming projects. And from a development and resource and training perspective, 
we're producing a number of resources and toolkits um, on our website, which take some of the complex tools I've mentioned today, like the active ingredients and the mechanisms of action, and translate them into accessible, user-friendly versions with worksheets uh, and uh, other downloads that can support practitioners, researchers, and policymakers. We also run the Arts Health Early Career Research Network, which has got nearly 1,300 young researchers all around the world who are working in this space. And we're helping to train up this new generation of researchers, including through things like our Arts Health Research Intensive, which is running in May of this year again for the fourth time, uh, this time in snake maltings in Suffolk. Um, and this is a week long course for anybody working in this field to upskill them in research methods and theory. We also work with a number of doctoral training programmes so we can take PhD students funded into the centre to develop work in this area. And we're also publishing free online courses such as our Royal Society for Public Health course that supports people in understanding the theory that underlies arts and health. So for more information on all of this, you can see our website artshealthcc.org. And we're really excited about the opportunities that are going to be growing in this space particularly the ongoing and future collaborations with the World Health Organization. Thank you very much. Thank you. It was a fantastic uh, overview of the work you're doing and also the transformation in the area of arts and health, arts in health, uh, towards whatever is now emerging in it. And one of the things that seems to be emerging from this is a different sort of relationship, not only between the patient and the medical health provider, but also between the researcher and the people being researched. So for example, you have lots of the tools that you're creating are being, are being made available online. They're being made in a version that people can adapt. Uh, you're working to build this future generation of researchers. Uh, so Professor Frankfurt, I'm wondering where, what are the next What's the next 10 years? What's the next 20 years? What are the next steps? That's an enormous question. I think I'm really excited that we're now getting to a stage where the levels of research grants that are going into this area and the level of seriousness that it's being seen with mean that we're getting fantastic researchers coming and working in this space. And we're also able to do the scale and scope of projects that wouldn't have been imaginable a few years ago. So we're now able to run large multi-site clinical trials, even international multi-site clinical trials, to actually take this work forwards. I'm also seeing a lot more embedded work, so work that's proper true partnerships between the art sector and the health sector. I think co-design is something we have to mention as well, as you, we've heard a lot about today, in particular from Chris. This isn't just being done to people, this is all being designed with people, and we're really proud that within our centre we have a huge focus on co-design and all of our projects are developed with members of the public, with patients, with healthcare professionals. And this, this uh, bi-directional learning, I think, is absolutely crucial to make sure that projects are really well conceptualized from the start and well designed. And I also think theoretically, being able to start using frameworks like complexity science to be able to understand these effects, this moves us into a domain of thinking scientifically where we're actually not oversimplifying. We're not trying to reduce the art, but actually genuinely starting to capture how and why they're affecting us. And this level of detail and articulation is what's really enabling us to step up to a sort of next level of scientific pursuit in arts and health. And we might bring Chris back in at this point. And while we're doing that, I want to mention to the audience in the room and also the audience online, that this session was set up really to raise questions. And in the next session, uh, with Roger O'Sullivan and with uh, Roseanne, Kelly, who, Roseanne Kenny, who runs the Irish Longitudinal Study, it's an opportunity to take your questions from this session into a particularly Irish context. So, um, Christopher, I might try and bring you in here. Is, there's a, it's, if I'm working in somewhere that's a, you know, a, a, a developing country, actually data is, is little and far between, really. So how do we, what do we focus on? What do you focus on? And, and is it the same kind of data? We lost sound with Chris or is it Chris Mike? These things happen. Okay, Christopher, you might be muted.
There, how's that? Perfect. That yeah, I was just uh, saying that uh, we're working now with the University of Global Health Equity in Rwanda on a scoping study of arts and health practices in sub-Saharan Africa. And uh, of course, uh, uh, even in our nascent field in the North, um, there are many more peer-reviewed published uh, articles out there uh, from which to, to analyze, uh, and they are more few and far between in the global south. Uh, but I also think that uh, we need to be careful uh, about looking at uh, the evidence in the global south as, quote, non-existent. Um, it's a, a somewhat academically colonial view of the world. Uh, and I think there are ways of being able to harness that that are robust and legitimate uh, without necessarily um, uh, imposing a, uh, a, a um, limiting worldview uh, uh, on the evidence. Because the reality is, uh, when I've worked in the Navajo Nation in the U.S. or worked with those artists uh, or, or worked in the Indian subcontinent or in Africa or in areas of Latin America, um, it, the conversation inevitably becomes about, not about how the North can bring uh, techniques and knowledge to them, but in this field in particular, uh, indigenous groups in particular have been practicing arts and health for millennia. Uh, we have much more to learn from them than vice versa. Uh, I think working with them to find appropriate methods of being able to harness that knowledge, understand it, measure it, uh, is, is part of the challenge and part of the opportunity. Uh, but uh, to, to say that, uh, oh, there's no evidence, is to fly in the face of thousands of years of, of practice and uh, opportunity. I'll give a concrete example. Um, when we had a virtual town hall with Navajo artists in the American uh, West, um, I asked very specific questions uh, about, um, do you have, uh, what, what kind of mental health support do you have during the epidemic? Um, uh, what, what is, how many psychologists, you know, certified psychologists do you have in the Navajo Nation uh, that people have access to? And the responses were very interesting. They said, well, hardly any, um, but also the whole notion of the talk cure, of going into your personal past to resolve your personal problems is not really how they see their identity. It's, it's much more of a social identity. And so the, the, the traditional um, methods of classical psychology don't always resonate uh, with that population anyway. And then they began to describe some of the communal dance and music uh, processes that ceremonies that they've had for time immemorial. Um, and, and what the effect of that is. And, and again, uh, I, I think we have to be very careful about our own assumptions of judging um, the, the, the people that we're trying to study or engage with. And, and in that sense, despite well-meaning intentions, we objectify them. And uh, I, I think particularly in this field, it's, it's, uh, there's an opportunity to actually engage, to listen, to observe, to exchange, uh, and to build a narrative together. Uh, one of the most influential books for me was Augusta Boal's Theater of the Oppressed. Uh, and uh, I, I've used that as a template working with other agencies and, uh, and on the ground, where it's not just about using the arts to convince people of your point of view, but to hand them the microphone, to, to give them the control of the narrative and the script and, and to see what emerges a, a, as an iterative dialogue. And, and that's more the direction that I think we have to go. To me, it goes back to my favorite quote from Carl Jung, who said, loneliness is not the absence of people. It is the inability to express what matters to you most. 
And when we use the arts as something operant, um, we are actually denying the people we're trying to help that moment of critical expression. Uh, uh, we need to, in, in, in the world of emotions and expression, stop giving people fish. We need to teach them to fish, give them the implements to fish. That feels like a lovely place to bring this section to a, a pause, I suppose. Um, I'd like to thank Daisy Fancourt. I'd like to thank Christopher Bailey. Uh, we'd like to thank them in the room. And the reason for bringing it for a pause rather than a halt is what I now want to do is bring in uh, the presentation by Theo Edmonds. So uh, if we can set that up and run it, that would be great. Um, and I think the presentation you're about to see runs in parallel with the conversation that we've just had. Um, Hi there, my name is Theo Edmonds. I'm the Associate Dean for Transdisciplinary Research and Innovation at the University of Colorado here in Denver. I'm also a culture futurist. And during our time together today, I would like to talk with you about stories and imagination. Chris, Daisy, Dominic, I really wish that I had the opportunity to be there with you today. And I look forward to hearing the conversation on the other side of this presentation. Can we live the best story that we can tell? It's a big question. Science has a way of telling a story. Data tells stories. The media for sure tells stories. All of us are telling stories all the time. But as Raghava KK, an artist, reminded us in Boma, Paris, can we live the best story we can tell is perhaps the more important question. You see, imagination is where it all begins. All human knowledge began as imagination. When we stood and we looked up at the sky and we thought, I wonder what that's all about. The instinct to know the unknown. When we gather with our friends, we feel it. The instinct to belong, the instinct to be part of a group, the instinct to create with others and to have status in that creation. Even in nature, the instinct is there, just like it is in all human activity. All human knowledge began as imagination. So in our time together today, I'd like to explore the opportunities for imagination to help us resolve some of the incredible pain points that we're all feeling in the world today. In our time today, let's talk about innovating through culture. Pain points, they're all around us. There's a secret painful and lonely wisdom that comes from being a cool wet seed in hot scorched earth, caught between mud brick and flame, caught between moonlight and Cadillac cars, caught between running and clutching. A cool wet seed turning in hot scorched earth. Revealing the imaginative truths of Pharisees and merchant kings to be seen for what they are. They are wet bones standing in bloody shoes, a house on fire. A baby with a swollen belly. A child looking at us from puzzled soul, noticing the emperor's new clothes. A child begging of us the only question which truly scares us. Why do some want to be rulers everywhere? And somewhere, at this moment, a seed turns, reaching to touch the light. For the last decade, my work and my research have really focused on the future of work. And what I'd like to share with you are some things that I found to be growing pain points for both people and organizations, specifically here in the U.S. is the context of many of these next comments. You see, the way we work has become a drag on our national innovation because the typical American worker will spend more hours at work than any other part of their waking lives. We're highly disengaged and the cost is staggering. The Great Resignation. 
4 million people have left their jobs each month in the U.S. since July 2021. MIT Sloan Management reported in January of this year that toxic work culture is the number one reason that people are leaving. And when we think about America's essential workers, our declining health system is stressed to the max. Nearly one in five healthcare workers have quit their jobs during the pandemic and even before COVID, our system was showing signs of strain. We are an older country here in the US. And so over the next many years, those over 65 will exponentially jump as a percentage of the population, approximately 93 billion in excess medical costs and 42 billion in lost productivity last year as well due to economic losses from disparities. Together, this is a threat to not only our nation's innovation capacity, but as my friend Carol Graham at the Brookings Institute reports, this is a threat to our national security. And then the creative industries. We're not doing so good either. You see, the creative industries economy and ecosystem is not, create, is not accommodating all creators. Globally, we employ more 18 to 25 year olds than any other field of employment. But in our fastest growing areas, like gaming, 75% of the world's video game developers are white. And just 8.3 of its main characters in all games were females of non-white ethnicities. America's public education system is also not doing so good either. One in four American teachers is considering leaving their job. The way that we have developed careers and work are out of sync with the way people's lives have evolved, mostly due to technology. You see, in the past 100-year-old industrial economy, a third, of, you, third of it was education, then you went to work, and those who were lucky enough to be able to retire, you retired. But in the emerging future of work, that model doesn't hold any longer. Led by millennials, and especially Gen Z, who have no expectation of staying in the same job or even the same industry, let alone over the course of their career. Things are fast changing, but our systems and our institutions have not caught up with the way people are conceiving of their careers. We're going to need all the creativity we have in our corporate community, in our business community, and in our health, health and hospital systems, and in our education systems. But that creativity may look different than it has in the past. You see, whether individual group creativity, like an LGBT group or a black employee group or Hispanic employee group, whether or not that ever becomes enterprise-wide innovation depends upon the alignment of the motivations of that particular group and their novel insights with those of the organization. So the environmental conditions for creativity are not a one-size-fits-all model. This is why the things like inclusion become an innovation play when considered in these contexts, because that helps us to understand what the alignment might be. And that is why at the University of Colorado Denver, we are building an imagination engine for the future of work. It has three different components to it, a research and data hub. Next month, we'll be launching one of the largest studies ever on how identity is shaping the American imagination in business. It contains a Creative Works Venture Studio. We developed a methodology for scanning for creativity across many, many disciplines and then pulse testing to see if those creative ideas have the potential to be transformed into intellectual property and market innovation. And finally, an experience lab, a customized upskilling research and innovation support service for organizations of all kinds as they transition to the future of work. In the Imaginator Academy, we are innovating through a distinctly human lens. We value things like Sankofa, looking back in order to go forward. And when it comes to diffusion of innovation, we're not focused on the early majority. We're focused on the early adopters, those people who are motivated by change, no matter what discipline they come from, and who are de-risking that innovation and that change 
for the early majority to step into because you see just PRing your way or marketing your way to the early majority that they should change is most likely not going to work. It is that group of early adopters, those in the imaginator zone, who are de who we depend upon to de-risk that innovation, that change, whatever it might be, for the early majority to step into. Because you see, with innovation, you can't have innovation without culture change. And culture change can't happen without innovation. That's the reason that perhaps most organizations are fundamentally getting it wrong. They are the innovation and culture change are the same thing. And yet we put culture change over in HR and we put innovation in another part of the organization. We have to start seeing these two things as the very same thing. That is why I have worked in developing what I'm calling the culture imagination model. I believe that culture is the uh, operating system of humanity and those memories, those customs, those symbols that we all have, they define the questions that we ask of data. We all know what questions Mark Zuckerberg's lived experience, for example, might dictate of the questions he asked of a data set. But how about the black lesbian in Appalachia? How about the single Hispanic mother in rural Colorado? They are making meaning and creating value in their lives, just like anybody in Silicon Valley. So innovation is happening everywhere, whether or not we understand it, whether or not we can name it, and whether or not we can invest in it is a different question. So this is what 10 years of research has led me to codify. I believe that in instincts matter. Instincts are why someone chooses to participate in group efforts. Then you have the vibes of a group how a group responds to their external environment. And then just like hot molten metal, metal <laughs> in a uh, sculpture lab, when it is poured, poured into a form, it becomes that form. So the form that the energy is poured into matters because if you pour everything as a hammer, everything will look like a nail. So let's break these three things down a little bit. So all of these things together, form a culture feedback loop. They're always acting, and just like culture, they're always shifting. So it's important to know where to bring the right action, the right energy, the right resources in order for problem solving. In the research, all of these areas have been shown to be highly influential as a mediating force, and in some cases, causally linked to population health performance education, economic performance, community integration, social unrest and progress, labor productivity, and firm profitability. So from management literature to health care research to uh, population health to the humanities to the arts, all of these things are interconnected and all are influenced by the same systems of human imagination. So let's talk about instincts. When we're talking about instincts, what we're really talking about here is how people's instincts are synchronized with their internal and external lives. So if you think about the instinct to know yourself as the intrinsic motivator and the instinct to know the unknown as the extrinsic motivator, you think about personal agency, you think about connecting with others, you think about having status, you think about creating with others instincts, why someone chooses to participate in group efforts, connect the head, the heart, and the hands together. And then there's the vibes, how a group responds to its external environment. We have these multidimensional constructions of our cultural self and the capacity of a group or an organization to respond to its environment is, is, depends upon this. Then you have the cultural value, the value of the response of the group to the external change. It looks something like this. So if you conceptualize the multidimensional aspects of yourself, all of these factors that you see here play into that multidimensional construct. And we come in and out of this all the time. But then when you think about the capacity of an organization to be able to respond to the changes in the external environment, that capacity is determined, we believe, through hope, trust, and belonging. If not causally related, they are at least highly influential. Hope is not optimism. Optimism is a belief. Hope is an agency question. Earn trust is a believability question. And then belonging 
Am I safe? Am I connected? Do I share a future with the folks in this room? All of these are questions we've asked in every room that we've ever walked into in entire, our entire lives. Then the value of the response depends upon the experience of culture change and the experience of innovation. In the experience of culture change, we measure things like how stakeholders are experiencing curiosity. What is their well-being orientation? Is it more hedonic, more eudaimonic? Sense of awe, community integration, things like job crafting, and then compassion. Compassion is key, I think, to a lot of this too. In our work, we are mostly uh, assessing organizations, so we're mostly measuring the compassion of other to other and other to self, but that self to self form of compassion and other to self is equally as meaningful. And the experience of innovation, these are things like creative behaviors and achievements, not only in the arts, but also in entrepreneurship, in science, in sports, creative self-efficacy, semantic memory and cognitive flexibility. This is literally a map of that national identity and American imagination study that I mentioned earlier in the presentation. And then when we take all of that and we put it into a form to make change in the world, to shape our society, these shared dialogues, these shared behaviors, these shared institutions all determine what will come out of this human activity. And in this human activity, an innovation play may look different if you're in a for-profit corporation as opposed to a grassroots community nonprofit. But it is still innovation nonetheless. The form that the shape takes place inside of depends upon what structure it is. And in each of these structures, Margaret Bowden talks about a lot, three different forms of creativity. And I think these really are three degrees of freedom. There's exploratory creativity, that is where you have gatekeepers and a very defined set of precepts uh, that a, uh, a discipline, for example, has. You have combinatory creativity where you take an idea from over here and over here and you put them together to produce new value. And then there's transformative creativity where the concepts and the gatekeepers and exploratory creativity just don't even apply it in the same way anymore because something so foundational has shifted. The iPhone is an example of that. So when we think about creativity, we're really talking about three degrees of freedom here that exist within inside of these organizations in which our future casting takes shape. So to put it all back together again, instincts are aligned, the group vibes and future casting is done in the shape of either an organization, a school, a business, a government, and all of these things together determine the culture imagination and it's what and the way in which it influences innovation in our society. You know, these are the things that are very tried and true tools of many, many artists. And I've been inspired throughout my career by one in particular, the work of James Baldwin. And he says that the precise role of the artist then is to illuminate the darkness and to blaze roads through vast forest so that we will not, in all of our doing, lose sight of purpose, which is, after all, to make the world a more human dwelling place. Friends, stories change the world. Can we live the best story we can tell is the question. Instincts, group vibes, and the shape of future casting all determine whether or not we will be able to do so. Thank you for our time together. I wish you a fabulous week, uh, all week this week. There's some amazing speakers and events, and it's my great regret that I cannot be there in person. But soon, I hope, uh, after the restrictions that we have all suffered under the last two years begin to end. Thank you so much, and enjoy the rest of your time together. So that brings us back to you online and you in the room. We set this session up to really raise questions, to raise questions about can you build a health-making system? Can you build a curative system on hope, trust, belonging, and compassion? Can you build one here in Ireland? Can you build one wherever you might be online? Uh, can you think about the construction and creation of data in a different kind of way? Can you think about
the story that we want to make about the world that we want to move into in a completely different way. And so we're going to take a half hour break and then come back to the next session. And then it becomes your job to see what we can move into. Thank you very much for this morning's session.